Welcome to the Business Legends Podcast, where we interview business leaders and entrepreneurs so that you can learn from their successes, pump up your own inspiration, and meet the people that make change happen. I'm the host of the show, Reese Arlen, along with my co-host, the greatest co-host that the world has ever seen, Christian Webb. Mm-hmm. Say yep. something. We just got the frog out of Reese's throat. We just got the frog out of my throat, so if I cough, I'm sorry ahead of time. Today, we are accompanied by George Ramsey with Bold Music Lessons. George, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. How so, bold are you feeling this morning? <laughs> I am feeling two and a half cups of dark coffee bowl. Ooh, so I think I'm good to go. That is that <laughs> extra bold. <laughs> yeah, that is extra bold. I was a little offended that you didn't take a coffee when we got here, but now I understand why. So. Oh yeah, I got up early. <laughs> I was like, all right, I'm going to knock out a couple hours of work, had a couple cups of coffee, then had a little time to kill, went to the co-working spot, had some more coffee, so I'm You're ready to go. I'm locked and loaded. You heard about Reese's energy from Jay, and you were like, I got to uh oh spaghetti, that's what he said. Um, <laughs> before the podcast, George was like, hey, so uh, is, do you, what, what should I do to prepare? And I just said, I I, he doesn't even know this. I said, uh, drink a Red Bull. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, I'm coming. I'm ready to go. <laughs> so uh, for all of our listeners, tell us a little bit about Bold Music, um, how long you've been in business, and what do you guys do? Cool. Yeah. So we started in September of 2013, a couple years after I graduated college. And we are primarily an in-home music lesson company. So okay. um, we hire local music teachers here. Um, in the past couple of years, we also expanded to Raleigh and the Triad and we hire local musicians and we get them private students. They show up to their house every week and teach them. Um, obviously during the pandemic, we transitioned heavily to virtual. So we now we, mm-hmm. uh, I was just saying before this, we, we've incorporated about 25% of our businesses is, is virtual um, instruction. And then we just do all sorts of other fun stuff, you know, community building things outside of our private lessons. So. Um, we do these uh, quarterly big performances called gig nights. We do open mics. We Sweet. do summer camps. We have a preschool program, all sorts of stuff. Um, but the meat of the awesome. business is um, private music lessons. And we're mm-hmm. essentially, I mean, you could you could call us brokers, right? We, mm-hmm. we kind of, we, we find customers for teachers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and vice versa. Yeah, so that's kind of that's kind of how it works. God, that's, that's awesome. Man. That is so amazing. So, what all what all instruments do you guys do? Just out of curiosity, is it primarily guitar? Or? We do. So the big three are piano, guitar, and voice. Actually, okay. um, but we do everything. So <laughs> yeah. we've got sixty. Actually, I think either sixty or sixty-one teachers right now. Wow. And so they're there, and they're all everything. So I mean. You name it, we probably teach it. The one mm-hmm. that's come up a couple times, we don't, we do not have an accordion teacher. Oh wow! Oh, but wow. apart from that, we've got we've got a lot. Pretty much anything you can think of, we we've got that at least accordion. somebody. Accordion, accordion. Yeah. How about how about uh, hammered dulcimer? <laughs> uh, I you know I think we probably have a couple guys. Do you who really? Can, who, who, well, who can who, maybe not their primary instrument, but sure. who can who can who could like dabble enough on it to yeah. teach teach a beginner probably. Oh my god! Would that be calling jamming out still on that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> medieval, medieval jamming. Is yeah, that medieval is. jamming. <laughs> That's cool. So um, let's go back to 2013. How how did you come up with this idea? I said no dates. What? I said no dates. Well, he said 2013. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. He said since We can do it. You got yourself in this. And that was an easy one, though, because I, I know when I graduated college. <laughs> oh, nice. And it's 10 years ago. It's your 10 yeah, year exactly. Exactly. So, so back to uh, when you graduated college, I yes, guess. Yes, um, yes. So how did you know that? Did you know that you want to do music? And what was your decision making like? Oh, that? yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I uh, was also an athlete. I played soccer for two years at cool. Davidson, where I went to college and where my business partner went um but the main reason i even went there in the first place was because i knew that i could be an athlete in theory be an athlete and a music major Mm -hmm. usually at a traditional like you know university being a music major you've got all these things you have to do outside of class like ensembles and things that you have to be in at davidson being a liberal arts school i could again in theory do both but after Mm -hmm. two years of playing soccer and being a music major I realized I couldn't do any of the extracurricular music stuff like Mm -hmm. I could do the classes which was fine but I wanted to be in bands and things like that so I quit playing soccer but I guess the moral of the story is I knew I wanted to be a musician Mm -hmm. you know probably since middle school I would say Mm -hmm. maybe early high school Um, and then you know towards the end of college it was like all right well like how do we make a how do I make a job out of this Um, I when I stopped playing soccer I started teaching music um, and I was like, oh, I'm pretty good at this. There's something here. Um, I was teaching out of a studio with my partner, Dean. And um, we basically, I mean, I, I don't recall the exact like conversations about, okay, we're going to start our own company. But it just mm-hmm. sort of, over time, we were like, why are we doing this for somebody else? Like, we could, right. we could run a much better operation and we can 
we both had teachers that came to our houses when we were growing up. And we were like, mm-hmm. we should just like, we don't have any money for a studio anyway, but like, it's also just a much better service to show up to somebody's house and teach them rather than making a someone come to you. So um, that was kind of the genesis of it. It was really, I mean, I joke about it, but like, I didn't want to get a real job. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I wanted to do music, right? And I wanted to have the flexibility to, at that time, I was still like heavily playing, you know, wedding bands. I was, I was, I was like a gigging musician who also taught you know, Monday through Thursday. Typically. So which one did you think would take off the gigging or the training? Oh, I, I learned pretty quick. I kind of realized that I didn't, I, I love performing. I love being in bands, but like the, the rigors of like, I've never actually been on tour really, but like mm-hmm. being a full-time performing musician or a studio musician to me was like, this is going to suck the life right out of the fun of it for me. Mm-hmm. So I was pretty intentional in making sure that the, I, I like my performing career or whatever not that i'm like an insanely gifted performer but like that i always wanted to make it fun and make it not feel like a job Mm -hmm. so when we started the company it was always like okay let's make the teaching thing the piece that we really you know build and 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 turn into something um for the for you know three or four years though like it really was just me dean always had a day job so his Mm -hmm. what what's been cool about him is he's had these day jobs that have been very pertinent to like the development of the company. So he worked Mm -hmm. for a digital big, you know, you guys know Red Ventures, huge Mm -hmm. digital, like early on in Red Ventures. Then he worked in, in basically recruiting. Um, then he worked, so he's had like, he's had these jobs that like lend the experience really well to to a startup. So, um, but for the first few years, I was the only teacher. Mm -hmm. So, um, it was, we, and we, we started the business with like a few thousand bucks. So it wasn't Mm -hmm. like there was like, if we failed, anything you know major would happen but um it didn't really start to we didn't really start to believe that we had a real business until we started hiring our first few teachers and like having some you know revenue generated that yeah. didn't come directly from my teaching yeah. mm-hmm. and then from there it sort of just slowly grew we never had like explosive explosive growth we were always kept it pretty um so can you remember back to when you were like you and Dean you're both training or maybe you were just training um and you were like Man, I need to start hiring. What did that feel like? Mm. Like, Can you remember that? Oh, man. Dean, I'm sure Dean remembers it because I think he actually made like the first couple hires, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Um, But for us, like the the stakes were just always a little lower than I'll tell you about the first employee hire in a second. (laughs) Like, but from our (laughs) teachers, like we never it was never an expense for us like to hire a teacher until we got them more because they're all right. 1099 contractors. Our job is oh, to fill nice. up their schedule, but they're mm-hmm. not, you know, they're not, they're not costing us payroll if they're not teaching. Right. Uh, and that's just the way the, the, the kind of the industry works. I mean, it'd be nice to just put everyone on salary, but yeah. it's mm-hmm. not a feasible thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so that wasn't that scary really. We were just like, okay, we need to find some teachers. Hopefully we can get them students. And if we can't, then no harm, no foul. Right. Mm-hmm. But it slowly did. We slowly did. Basically, once I was at like way over capacity myself, it was like, all right, let's bring some people. And then I started just pawning off some of my students to the new teachers and then slowly started building some momentum. Mm-hmm. Man, that's a, that's very interesting. I, I, re- I remember back and I don't know if you had the same scenario, but did you um, did you find like you were working overtime? You had all this. You had all these hours. You're probably making good money. And then you're like, let's scale this baby so we mm-hmm. make more money. And then you hire a couple people, and all of a sudden you're making less money. Mm-hmm. And you're like, why did I do this again? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we so never really was making much money. I'll be I'll be honest. So like we so the company, um, I was essentially subsidizing my work for the company, mm-hmm. being a gigging musician and and teaching and stuff like that. So like yeah. me being like the owner of the company, we weren't really. I mean, we just weren't really making any money for a long time. Yes. Um, but yes, mm-hmm. yeah. when we did over once we once we hired our first like actual employee to help like with the enrollments and the sales mm-hmm. and stuff like that, that was the first time I was like, oh shoot, like is this the right, is this the right move? Well, well, mm-hmm. that employee like came in and immediately it was just such an uh, such a clear like going from me doing every single thing. Um, again, Dean had his day job right so like for me doing every single thing to having someone that's in charge of like closing the deals like she was way it was more specialized she was really good at it 
I'm not that persistent and not that great at it. So like it immediately paid for itself, mm-hmm. which we, which was super lucky because we, so we didn't have, we, we, we really didn't have any time where like we hired someone and suddenly like, we were like, Oh shoot, we're not making any money mm-hmm. anymore. Right. Like it, like, like, Bottom like drift it always stuff. sort of, it always sort of the invest. Now, once we started getting like four or five, like employees, mm-hmm. not so much the teachers, then obviously like that eats into, profit but like as a company we've you know it's important to us that first and foremost like our first core values teacher first like we exist to help and support musicians so we got to pay them better than any other place that Mm -hmm. they can get paid and and i'm not neither dean nor i are particularly money motivated Mm -hmm. obviously we want to be we want to have a healthy strong business that's profitable um but we've kind of consistently over the years made decisions that we think are better like long-term decisions rather than like short-term let me put money in my pocket kind of thing mm-hmm. yeah so we'll see yeah it's, <laughs> it's good to be aligned like that um, yeah that I, I i will say that that's like one thing that christian and myself being business partner for six years we've we've uh we've always been very aligned on on the future expectations for a company mm-hmm. and stuff um, one of the things that you said was your one of your core values is musician first. Mm-hmm. Um, can you give us any insight into some of the other core values of, of bold music? Yeah. And what what types of things went into making that decision? Yeah. So the the whole kind of conversation <laughs> about core values started a, I don't know four years ago when we really we had we had reached this point to where like there was a few employees maybe thirty teachers and it was like okay. This is now not like a bunch of my friends. Like, I don't even know some of these teachers. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's like not anything against them. It's just like mm-hmm. there's too many people involved in the organization. How do we kind of build cohesion? Um, and we did like a, a strategy, a vision strategy session, two day session where we set our kind of three, five year plan with our immediate leadership team. And in, in those conversations, we really hashed out our core values as a way to kind of just standardize like this is the type of company we are this is what we care about these are the type of people like you need to care about these things too mm-hmm. if you want to work with us and if not great but that's it's not a you know there's no uh what's the word there is no we we don't like cave on that at all like mm-hmm. like, yeah. like there's no negotiation there yeah, yeah, yeah um so our other ones so we have teacher first relationship driven Um, you know, again, you can kind of all the programming and things we do outside. It's not simply just like show up and teach a lesson. It's like have an impact on people's lives. Mm -hmm. Um, always improving. That's just, that's like a business, but also a music kind of mantra, right? Like if you're, if you stop getting better at at an instrument, you can never know everything. Right. Right. We want people around who are constantly searching to get better. Um, community. Did I already say that? Uh, no, no. Relationship driven community teacher first, always improving. And exceptional service. That's three days paid <laughs> yeah. off, sir. Yeah, yeah. There you go. That's awesome. Uh, so, and so the exceptional service, obviously, like we are a service provider. So, you know, it kind of goes without saying that you need to have it, but like we're very personalized. We, going we into don't. House. Yeah, we're, exactly. Yeah. We're going into people's houses, um, and even with virtual, it's like, it, like learning music in a one-on-one situation is an intimate type experience where you're only going to really kind of blossom as a musician if you're comfortable and all of that stems from like there's so many I mean I could talk about this all day but like from the way that we operate logistically through the way that we communicate with people it's all about providing excellent service but like as we grow it's like how do we continue how do we maintain that level of service when there's more people I mean really it all boils Mm -hmm. down to people right there's more people involved and that obviously creates challenges yeah you're you're ahead of us on that so like we only have 14 so we're still Mm -hmm. humble enough to know them all but like I've been, I've been thinking about that. Like, what happens when we get to thirty or forty, and we're like, "Who's John?" Yeah, like you yeah. know, what I'm saying? it might, yeah. might happen. You know, especially remote. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, we, we already do BMSG day every other Friday, which is like we all go out and like hang out downtown together nice. and like get to know each other a little better because we miss each other all two weeks. Um, but I could see, man, a couple hundred people. It's it's a major challenge, and then <clears throat> you know we, you know, you hit a, a critical mass of teachers. Mm-hmm. We realized that our management team, you know, which is, you know, me, the CEO, CFO, um, our salesperson, a person who essentially does our um, community engagement programming stuff, Mm -hmm. and then our recruiter who, who hires new teachers, but also like does our social media. None of, none of those job descriptions are like 
oversight and management of the actual teachers. Mm -hmm. it, like we all sort of did it. And then like a couple of people took a lion's share, but then, you know, we realized, okay, like that piece is becoming a big job. And how do we, we, we can't, I mean, support our teachers enough. There's so many of them and none of our like prime accountabilities are, are looking after the teacher. So mm -hmm. we promoted a teacher from within who's been with us since 2015, Peyton, um, to be our teacher support specialist. So like his job is, and so the idea would be like, well, we've already done it. We've sort of like, so he's, he's in charge of the teachers and then we've split up, you know, the 60 teachers into let's call it six groups of 10 mm -hmm. and they meet monthly or every couple months. But, you know, eventually, you know, they'll probably be like a team captain or something of the groups. And yeah. then they're also, but like, there's no substitute, like, like kind of chain of command stuff or whatever you want. I don't want to say that it sounds too, military or corporate but like kind of org structure mm -hmm. until we hit uh, until we real and uh, until we like hit the point where we're like oh we don't have an org structure like mm -hmm. how is this going to work how are we going to provide oversight and management and all that kind of stuff um we didn't do it until we were like oh we don't have this and we need to isn't yeah that, isn't that the story of the entrepreneur oh like, yeah every yeah. single time it's like oh i need that <laughs> we were talking about sales until like afterwards yeah. before before the recording started like I've had this revelation in the past six months that we don't have a sales process. And it's like, wow, wow, this is awesome. Like we've made it to where we are, you know, almost 10 years in, but, and it's like, I'm, I'm pumped up because we have this huge opportunity to really improve our sales process. But at the same time, I'm like, wait a minute, how did we get here? And I didn't think of this yet. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's, it's constantly these things like in entrepreneurship where, um, you maybe you'll get in a group of other entrepreneurs or you'll talk to mentors and like the most obvious thing will be said right that you're not doing yeah and it's like anybody could have thought of it but you didn't think of it and you needed you needed somebody to kind of like yeah sh like feed you info you're like oh yeah i need to i need to do that so yeah. um definitely the story of entrepreneurship <laughs> like my, my golden flaw is that is that we have those revelations a lot more often than i might than i might care to admit Oh, and uh <laughs> me too every all entrepreneurs do. yeah and and i will never admit them like uh, like like <laughs> behind to, closed doors it out of them yeah <laughs> yeah behind closed doors we'll we'll talk about it and be like yeah. dude why didn't we do it that way yeah. and uh and like what we just i just don't admit it I we're guess, always you know? imposters we, we don't want yeah. we don't want people to realize that we have no idea what we're doing for sure <laughs> um so i have a question for you um this is more about the industry that you're in the, and you know the the nature of work that you have mm -hmm. Um, so you have all these different teachers and how many did you say 60, 60, I think we we're 60, 60 with like two in onboarding. Gotcha. Okay. So call it 60, 62. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you guys have an established curriculum or do you kind of allow each teacher to do their own thing? And what, what does that look like? That's a, that's a great question. So, mm -hmm. um, the, the short answer is no, our, our approach is, and this is kind of coming directly from my experience, learning music and teaching music, same mm -hmm. with Dean's is every relationship and every student teacher, like every student teacher situation is different. Sure. And so as the teacher, your job is to figure out what clicks with the student, maybe, you know, put what you think is important into your own curriculum for that student, but also yeah. like what that student wants and needs and cares about is really important. So it's all, it needs to be fully customized. Um, having said that, like the, depending on what instrument you're learning, mm -hmm. um, piano, for example, there is, there te like most of our teachers have sort of like the, you know, the book series that they teach out of sure. for, you know, that's, that's a pretty proven kind of system. Yeah. Alfred, uh, what's the other, there's, there's a few, mm -hmm. a few different ones. Find uh, Faber. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, but, but for instruments like guitar, um, there are books too, and there's mm -hmm. lesson programs and things like that. But, um, I like in my own experience as a, as a guitar teacher, I sort of compile different things from different, like I think learning how to read music is important, mm -hmm. but that's not like, I'm not going to spend, you know, the first six months of learning, teaching someone guitar, how to read music because mm -hmm. you don't read music for guitar the same way you read it for piano. Sure. So it, so it varies by the instrument um, sort of where we've gotten though is, is like up until now we've provided, we haven't provi provided enough support for our like new teachers and okay, here's, here's like best practices, here's help with your curriculum, here's some plans that you can adopt and use. So Peyton, our new teacher support specialist is very involved now on the onboarding side and mm -hmm. saying, You're, we're not gonna give you the curriculum, right. but we're gonna help coach you in determining basically the curriculum for each of yeah, your students. student advancement. Mm -hmm. stuff. And you know, you, you brought up an excellent point too, because I think about instruments and uh, I grew up, I, I played the flute first and the guitar second. And 
you think about how um, instruments are different and how they're professionally played. If you play the silver flute um, at a professional level, chances are you're playing in an orchestra, you know, so mm -hmm. you're reading sheet music. Whereas if you're playing the guitar professionally, you're probably in a band, more than likely. And there are, there are some, you know, orchestra guitars and things like oh, yeah. that. But, yeah. um, you know, the style is just so very different between the two of them, you know? So I yeah. think it's excellent. <clears throat> the, the, we get this all the time from, like, parents who are wanting to sign up for music. They're like, oh, I want my kid to read music, and I want to learn how to play. I want him to learn how to play guitar. And little Johnny wants to play Guns N' Roses. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, like, all of that is good, mm -hmm. but the way that, guitar, and I have a music degree, I can read music, I can play jazz guitar, I can play all these different things, like, you don't use traditional, you know, treble clef notation that you right. would use for flute, right. you don't use that for mm -hmm. contemporary guitar. Mm -hmm. You, there's tablature, there's chord charts, like there's yeah. this word, it's, 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 it's all important and it's all types of notation, and in my mind, it's all, it is reading music, mm -hmm. it's just not reading music like a lot of people in their mind think reading music is, which is like, the treble clef, bass clef, right in the songbook. Yeah. So it's like we sometimes have to sort of explain that. And if you're not, if you're not, if you don't understand music and you have no idea, you could sound like, okay, what are they? Are these guys right. like BS in us? It's like, no, sure. no, like this is really, this is this is the like I, reading traditional notation is great. Yeah. As a trained guitar player, it is insanely rare, mm -hmm. even in a professional setting that I read traditional notation. Sure. It just it's just not what I, you do. I was just telling Christian this on the on the way up here that um, that like I can read tabs to this day. No chance on on regular yeah. notation. Yeah, it. it's just it's different. Just, yeah. It, and and really like another way just to, like not to get too music nerdy. If you're looking at and I don't know I'll just compare guitar and piano cuz I don't mm -hmm. know flute or anything like that. But on a keyboard you have the low note the lowest note down here and the highest note up here. Mm -hmm. So like the way that notation is written, treble clef, bass clef, the bass clef are low notes, they go up in order to kind of mirror the the keys on the keyboard. It makes a lot of sense like visually and then like looking down at your keyboard. Right. Well on the guitar and middle C on a piano is here. There's right. one key for every note, one yep. key for every note going all the way up. On guitar, there could be five different ways to play the exact same note. Right. So middle C could be here, it could be, and on a guitar, if I'm like holding it, mm -hmm. there's low to high this way, and there's low to high this way. Right. So I could play a C here, I could play a C here, I could play a C here, I could play a C here. On the staff notation that you would look at for piano, it would look like the exact same note every time. Right. But on the guitar, it might make way more sense to play the C here than to play the C here. Yeah. So it, it's a, they're, they're just totally different. And the way that you represent how to play certain things on the guitar and and other fretted like stringed instruments sure is just it makes more sense not to not to do it the way that it's written for piano typically yeah, yeah. no we're getting sense. way too music tech <laughs> sorry me. yeah it gets, <laughs> i like, understood everything you just it said gets, it way. gets nuts like, Hola. yeah, yeah. 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 I, I was i was gonna i was just wondering what christian christian brought yeah. a steam out actually of his, he has this no whole time y'all were talking about that i was yeah. thinking about some really cool stuff so, oh good i was like right, yeah, yeah so go for I, it i have a great idea nice little break if this goes viral if it goes viral you owe me at least five percent okay five percent all right so I think you should go downtown in the city, in any city. I think you should get a white van with some bold music on it. Oh, my God. I think you should randomly <laughs> pop out around corners oh. and just any random person be like, I'm going to teach you how to play guitar ah. in two hours. And then you get it all on video of how ah. you made, how you improve them cool. from zero to wherever they're at. And do that all over the city with different instruments. Ah. Yeah, that would be cool. I bet that would go I bet that would go viral. I did a little like small business startup crawl thing uh, six months ago, mm -hmm. like right around the holidays. And I did that with a ukulele. I basically in this group of oh, cool. I did like a quick presentation, and then we had like I had like three ukuleles. I was like, all right, random people, here's your ukulele. In five minutes, I'm going to teach you something. That's awesome. And they kind of got it. it yeah. cool. I mean, literally, like I jump out of the van and be like, scare someone. And be like, <laughs> I'm ready to teach you guitar. Yeah, like, I, I mean, think it would be hilarious. You could probably do that with smoke in the water or something. Could be good or, content too. I mean, that would be great. I think it'd be great content. That's yeah. the whole point of it. Like it'd be even funnier if you did drum lessons because you literally get each piece of drum out and yeah. it's like showing the oh, that'd be hilarious. Hang on, here you go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That would if, be awesome. if it goes viral, let me know. <laughs> That's incredible. So, uh, do you teach people how to play stairway? By the way. Oh yeah. Yeah, you have to. Yeah, I have. I mean, I taught a lot. I mean, I don't teach anymore, but like. Yeah, that was my next question. In my so. in my in my prime, I was probably teaching you know thirty students, and I I probably taught wow. stairway to heaven. A lot, a hundred times. Sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, like a lot, a lot of times. You have to. I mean, it's yeah. just it's just one of those like. 
But the thing is about that song, sorry, Christian, I know you're about to not have any idea what we're talking about, but it's just that it teaches you so much on how to play. Yeah, and stuff. that's, that's so, the thing. There's a lot yeah. of technical p- parts of it that there's a great guitar solo, there's mm-hmm. finger picking, the, the type of kind of like chord theory going on is great. Like yep. it's, it's all really, it's, it's actually a great educational piece. For sure. Absolutely. And it's like, it's one of the most, uh, I'll say prolific rock songs of all time yeah. too. So you yeah, your to. best testimonial ever is if you could teach me how to play anything that I would not sign up for that challenge if I were you. Yeah. Be very oh, it can be done. I've I never would charge me double for sure. <laughs> Triple probably, you know, but, um, so actually I would, I would like to talk about that though. So, um, what is your approach? So often, and just to give you some backstory, when we when we talk to entrepreneurs, we talk to them about challenges they've had and, and such. Mm-hmm. And um, all students are different, you know. And yep. some pick up music very quickly. Some struggle with it a lot. And what what has your approach been, uh, both for yourself and for your company, when you have, you know, a student that's just not getting it? Mm, yes. So the first thing is, as a kid. If you don't get it, like, there's no magic bullet. You have right. to just practice, like, mm-hmm. and anybody can do it. You can do it. You just have to be like, I'm gonna focus on this and practice and do the repetition and do what my teacher tells me to do, mm-hmm. and eventually you'll get it. You may not be an incredible, prolific, prodigious guitar player, but mm-hmm. like, you probably you could you could get pretty good. So a lot of it is coaching the parent. Sure. And this is like again, this is goes back to like kind of wow. support and advocacy for our teachers, where it's like have this conversation with the parent Mm -hmm. and and you also have to be thinking long game right Right. so we've this is this is actually this these past couple weeks we we see a we always see a little bit of drop off because um sports are picking back up now and so we always get the oh my kid's too overwhelmed and he's not able to practice and blah and we're like okay like if you really want to stop that's fine and but like learning the learning a, a musical instrument and like starting and stopping every time you're school or or your club sport season starts is not the way to learn music like even if you are you know you're doing your lacrosse and your football and your soccer and your whatever and you get like no time to practice Mm -hmm. except like maybe in your actual lesson Mm -hmm. and you don't even practice until the next week that is still worthwhile because you're getting that consistent even if it's just once a week yeah it's Mm -hmm. not ideal but we so there's like coaching parents on hey listen like your kid's busy. We get that. It's still beneficial. You might feel like you're wasting your money, but you're not. You're really going to be wasting your money when you stop and start and start and stop. And, sure. and then your kid will truly get to high school and quit and college and never and then call us and you know and when they're 40 years old, I'm like man, I really wish my parents would have pushed me. Mm-hmm. So you know, we try and sort of coach that into into families, but also teachers, right? Mm-hmm. So we have a whole different range of personalities of teachers that that work with us and as a teacher obviously my favorite students are the ones who are really interested and engaged and plugged of course. in that always represents a pretty small subset of the general student population so we also have to get our teachers to kind of understand the big picture as well it's not like disrespect mm-hmm. to you as the teacher if a kid's not practicing if, if the kid's being disrespectful that's a problem mm-hmm. but like just because a kid is distracted and not practicing as much as you, the professional musician, sure. practices and wants them to practice. Mm-hmm. Like it's 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 okay, mm-hmm. and you'll hopefully get a you know find something that really piques a kid's interest, and then they'll start to want to practice more. Right. Um, but just not getting it to me is like it doesn't matter. Like if yeah. if, if you value music, it's not a race. You right. could be doing this. You should be doing this your whole life. Mm-hmm. Um, because there will come a time in your life when you're you have time on your hands theoretically maybe after maybe that's after your kids are grown and and off it's hard to kind of think that long ahead but like if you put in the groundwork when you're a kid it'll come back Mm -hmm. and if you don't put the groundwork in as a kid it's gonna all you can still do it but it's gonna be a lot harder when you get older sure (laughs) yeah do you um so just out of curiosity do you prefer the um the kids that that are very musically gifted or do you prefer the ones that that um, have to work really hard at it, and and they do work really hard at it. Oh, me personally, both. Probably different teachers would say different things. Sure. Um, because there's plenty of teachers who really like working with beginners and seeing that progress, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if you're already a good musician, there's like you definitely hit a plateau. So right. if I if I pick up working with an advanced student, I might not notice the difference between 
you know, here to here skill wise. Right. But like when you first start from nothing, it's like, wow, exponential at first, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? So, um, I like it all. Yeah. Um, it, for me, it's like attitude. If you have the right attitude, um, even if you don't practice, even if you don't really have much talent, yeah, like that's what I like. Yeah. You can kind of make <laughs> something work. For so sure. you were saying yeah. you were building out your sales process. I just had a, uh, interesting idea for your sales process. So, um, is there any way you could show a little Timmy or a little Tammy or whatever, um, like on a guitar day one, like a video of the, mm. the person trying to play a song day 30, six months, 12 months, and then two years and mm. have like that lined up. And it would be like a, maybe like a 20 second reel. And yeah. It would literally show the transformation and it shows the time. Mm. That way the parents understand that it's a long game. You can't take breaks if you're trying to get to this point. And also the kids see what as, is at the end. Yeah. As well. No, that's that, a really great idea. And I think that'd be sick. We've talked about it. We were, we were, you know, texting about it in our like management group the other day about, you know, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to remember how far a student has come, mm -hmm. but like that take on it could be really, could be a really cool thing that the teacher sort of has to share with the, with the student, yeah. but also as marketing material. Right. Yeah. Because you just said that they yeah. were, uh, the parents were like quitting because of sports and stuff yeah. and mm -hmm. they saw this. Maybe they wouldn't think about that. Yeah. Oh, no, I mean, and, and, and I think generally speaking, like what I just told you guys, mm -hmm. we don't probably, we, we probably don't communicate very well, right, to mm -hmm. our customers. Mm -hmm. um, if we set the table for that in our sales and like at the very beginning and in all of our marketing and in the voice that, the way that we speak with our customers, mm -hmm. that expectation might be different. Whereas mm -hmm. like, like we don't tell, like for example, we probably don't tell people, we, we're like a subscription model. Like you sign up and you can leave, you give us 30 day notice, you can leave mm -hmm. when you leave. But like, we don't, we probably to a degree do, but we don't really tell people like, don't sign up if you're just gonna quit when sports start. Right. Like, <laughs> you Makes sense. Like though. don't waste your money. I mean, obviously we wanna like, well, maybe not that, but we should prep them for that eventuality and say that, you know, We've built this Life business happens. for people like you. Yeah. Yeah. Life is going to get busy. Well, guess what? We've got really flexible virtual instruction if you want it. The in-home stuff is great. You don't have to take, you know, it's one less thing you have to take your kid to. If your schedule gets crazy, we are here to help. We can get you a new day, a new time, a new teacher, whatever you need. Mm -hmm. yeah. But like, don't quit. Right. Now, obviously, the cynical person will be like, oh, well, you just want to keep getting our money, which obviously we want long-term retention and all that kind of stuff as a business. But like, it's... I'm case in point of it. I had to take my parents forced me to take piano lessons as a kid mm -hmm. and I was horrible at it. I hated it. My older brother <laughs> and sister were really good and it just pissed me off because I was not good at reading music. Mm -hmm. I, I, for, I, like my brother would learn something he played and he'd remember it forever. And I'd be like, I'm an idiot because I do my <laughs> I would do my recital and immediately forget whatever the, the thing was. So I hated yeah. it, hated it, hated it. But my parents were just like, this is non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. You're going to do piano lessons and you can bitch. Are you my allowed to cuss? You oh, yeah. yeah you, you can bitch and moan about it. the hell you want, bro. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> this is business legend. So you can bitch yeah. and moan about it all you want, but I, you're wasting your breath because you're going to do it. Right. And and so, like, hated it, hated it, hated it, hated it. Well, eventually I was like, oh, that's actually kind of kind of cool that I, mm -hmm. that I know this. And then I started getting to middle school and high school and started learning some other instruments. I had the piano foundation, which so I understood music, even though I wasn't really – couldn't really talk about it well, but I kind of knew it. Sure. Um, I had I had a good foundation. It was so easy for me to le learn new instruments. Like mm -hmm. I could pick up a guitar and in like an hour I was playing chords on the guitar. I was like, oh, sure. this is amazing. Yeah. So like I'm case in point in it. I was a very competitive soccer player. Like that was my focus all of my childhood. And we and music fit in when it could. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying everybody has to then go on and become a professional musician. But I know, I mean, my brother's a great example too. He was similar. Mm -hmm. He's a he's a fantastic musician. He just he had to stick with it. You mm -hmm. have to stick with it as a kid. And it's like, what are you teaching your child when you when like the going gets hard and you're like, okay, yeah, just just stop. Like right. you're overworked, whatever. Like I understand not over committing mm -hmm. as a as a kid, but like with music lessons, what we're really talking about is forty five minutes to an hour a week. Mm -hmm. Like. That's yeah, like, yeah you can really find come on. Yeah, <laughs> like, there's other things. Time. Yeah, like when you say you're overwhelmed and overworked, my gut reaction, and I obviously I don't tell this to, to families, but like my gut reaction is like, f like find something else to cut. I mean, maybe it's maybe the money's an issue, or like obviously you know, there's other sensitive things. to that. life happens. But Fifteen like, hours of iPad time. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. It's like <laughs> sure. it's like does your like so does your kid play video games at all? Yeah. Okay, interesting. You know, like yeah. it, so it's it's and, and you know it's just and and for me it's coming not from a place of judgment. It's coming from a place of like I was this kid mm -hmm. and I know how this works and I've been doing it for ten years with my company 
and you will regret it. Parent ABC, you will regret it. Maybe you're fed up with fighting with your kid, mm-hmm. and and you feel that right now. You're like, I'm sick of this battle, constant battle with my kid because he doesn't want to practice or whatever. Um, vent to us. Tell us that. Say, hey, mm-hmm. my kid really is not practicing. He doesn't seem interested. There's all sorts of things we can try. We can t- try a new teacher. We can give support to your to your current different teacher. Music. Different music, different instrument. Like, mm-hmm. do not stop. Yeah. Um, and even just talking about this out loud again, because I haven't really talked about this out loud in a long time. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm like, wow, I really, there's a lot of coaching I can kind of do sure. for our team, like from a retention perspective, <laughs> to just not be, like, not in a pushy way, but just like, con- like convince people and tell people, like, listen, you, this is an important, what you're, what you're paying for right now is something that your kid's going to benefit from their entire life. Mm-hmm. And as hard as it might be right now, you will regret it if you quit, if yeah. you let them quit. You know, um, one of the, one of the Christian was talking about like the marketability of like <laughs> jumping out of a sketchy yes, free candy yeah, van right, right. or something. The bold like music that. van. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> 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 I'll sponsor the van. Let's make, let's make it not a sketchy van and then I'm going to feel a little better about it. it. bold but, lessons on stuff. Yeah, but you said, you said like a white windowless van and jumping out of maybe it. Maybe like windows. Yeah. I feel like we should have some windows. windows maybe yeah, like a so wrap. Like make windows. it something that looks, you know, not Can we keep the ski mask? No, <laughs> I don't think the ski mask probably would, would, okay. wouldn't be on brand. <laughs> Any, anyway, um, you know, I was thinking about all the all the benefits that I got out of playing music my whole life, and he makes fun of me to this day because he says I can I can hear a song once and then like oh, remember it. He's you know? awful, and and I mean I, I do to this day, but I played music for ten years. Yeah, you know? and I think about all the all the benefits that I got. I mean, I I would um, for somebody like me at least, I would I would um, if I were you, I would love to have something. That was put together that shows all the benefits that mm-hmm. that you know, especially children as they learn music, what benefits that carries with them throughout their lives. Yeah. Um, one of the weird things I just remember is piano because it's it's a, a you know two hand instrument. Yeah, it, it strengthens the corpus callosum, which is the uh, connection between the hemispheres of the brain. Mm. And um, I, I mean, I just think stuff like that's really cool. Well, and this is all this is all great. I'm like trying to. Well, I'll have the recording. Of this, yeah, so I'll be yeah, able, I'll be able to like pull up on this conversation yeah. because. As we're redoing our sales strategy and our marketing, mm-hmm. you know, kind of like deal pipeline, yeah, um, we're going to need a ton of content, right? Yeah, we've got a lot. We've got a blog, and we write a lot. But historically, our blog is written like me being a music nerd explaining some sure. topic. Yeah, when yeah. really, the yeah, stuff. yeah. <laughs> like when the sure. reality, like the the marketing content, should be really geared towards the parent and who primarily words. video, visual. video, less yes. words, exactly, yep. and like and and making the case. So maybe yeah. you give us a little interest. You feel like give us your email address, and you're like, oh, I'm kind of interested in these guys. Yeah. Well, our job is, over the next however, like it could be years, is mm-hmm. to feed you content that's going to convince you that this is something I need in my life, and mm-hmm. the benefit, you know, the later in life. These are these are all things that I talk about all the time. We mm-hmm. just don't. It's just not our marketing. Right? Yeah. Sure. There's like the benefit of learning music as a kid. What? How is that going to mm-hmm. impact your life later on? Well, you can make a great video blog series on just that Mm -hmm. right definitely um the delayed i mean there's so there's this like concept now that people are talking about the delayed gratification Mm -hmm. where so much is immediately available to us music there's no cheat code right it takes discipline and there it's a process no matter how much you hope it's not it's this perfect way to like train yourself to be able to handle delayed gratification so there's like a lot of things and it's if we just make that case to families and parents because you know, eight times out of 10 is the mom kind of signing up for music lessons sure. or the say it could be a dad, but it's like the parent who you're talking to marketers. We don't run away yeah. from stereotypes. Yeah. 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 For yeah. sure. Stats are stats. Stats are stats. Right. And, and so like we need to be communicating with them, Yeah, you know, and we haven't really done that yet, but that's why this is fun. That's why entrepreneurship mm-hmm. is fun. It's like, I find this new, you know, obsession to latch onto. And I'm like, wow, we have this huge business opportunity. Mm-hmm. Imagine what we could be if we figure this out. Sure. <laughs> oh sure. man. Um, we're, so we're wrapping up here time wise. Cool. Um, I, I know I was smiling as you were talking. Um, it's so funny cause I, I said literally the exact same thing to Christian when we were driving up here. I called him up and, uh, we were talking about stuff, but I was talking about how music is, is something that it doesn't matter how gifted you are at music. You have to practice. There's no, yeah. there's no, nobody on the face of the earth that just picks up a guitar and looks at it and then just starts, no. you know, ripping away at Van Halen and stuff, yeah. you know? Um, so it's, it's just an incredible thing. Um, so before before we get out of here, um, I do want to talk to you a little bit about your virtual. Um, I don't know what you call it, but yeah. um, now did you start this through COVID, going going virtual, or how did that work exactly? Yeah, so we started 
in a, a, the year before COVID, we'd reached kind of a critical growth stage where mm-hmm. rescheduling lessons was bec- in home lessons was becoming a total nightmare. Sure, makes <clears> sense. So we actually introduced virtual makeup lessons right before cool. COVID. So we yeah. got very we got very lucky. But it's basically uh, up until now, and we, we we may transition to something we I want to very soon. But it, we basically have like a. a password protected place on our website i was wondering about where that, yeah. it's nothing proprietary but where like all of our teachers have their zoom basically like their zoom meeting link sure linked to their picture on yeah. our on our website and essentially for like for virtual lessons you just go to that password protected site click on your teacher's picture and it starts the zoom meeting gotcha um so nothing we didn't develop anything proprietary but um it obviously like having that set up made us look really good when COVID yeah. hit because it looked and, and we had trained You're our ahead teachers. Of we were ahead of it, trained our teachers on how, you know, how to do virtual instruction. We spent we spent a year planning on like weighing the pros and cons, planning it, because it was a big policy shift for us. Sure. But when COVID hit, it was in like an email sent out to all of our family saying, Hey, we're going virtual for two weeks or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then that it was, was just, it. <laughs> yeah. Then it, yeah. Then it was just <laughs> virtual so, forever. Have you taken the time to have you taken that time to look at it as a customer yet and see like what the customer is visually seeing about your virtual stuff? Oh, it's not good. I mean, I mean, I would say, uh, and that, that's me being harsh. I mean, we we did we did things like we we made kind of custom landing pages for mm-hmm. the Google or for mm-hmm. the uh, virtual lessons, and we did do a virtual lesson promo video, and things like that. But it, it but it's not. We realized, and this was you know three whatever however however long ago that was. We yeah. realized that it's very it is hard to market virtual lessons. Now, mm-hmm. I think we can do it if we have a much bigger strategy that we're now thinking about doing. But at that point, it was like Google ads, SEO, that's our that's our marketing strategy. And our competition for virtual lessons is, oh, I can just do this on YouTube. Mm-hmm. I just look this up on YouTube. And sure. you kind of can. So like making the case, <laughs> well, you can if you're like going to be self-disciplined and you're going to have the wherewithal to know what's BS Nobody's and what's not. No, no, they're not. But like that would be the it's a little bit harder of a, of a sell, or it was back then. I mm-hmm. think now it's almost like an accepted way to learn. Um, but no, like the user experience uh, across the board needs work. But we're we're, yeah. we're just kind of That's slowly a checking. Funny the way off. to find kinks is if you mm-hmm. like turn around and look up at your brand, and you're yeah. like, because I, I do this to our company sometimes, and I'm always like, I need to yeah. fix some yeah. stuff. But it's yeah. like you look at it, and you're like, okay, so if I click around here, if I go here, I'm looking for this. Wow, this is what my customers are seeing right now. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's that's the uh, power of the incognito window. You <laughs> you yeah. open it up in a new in a new tab and see what you know, see what the experience is on the other end. Yeah. Um, have you guys produced anything in the way of resources? So um, I was just thinking out loud here, but you know, let's say you have teacher Jim and Jim, um, you know, may put together a couple videos of like, this is my approach to chords and this is my approach to, you know, oh, whatever, yeah. blues positions mm-hmm. or something like that. This is my favorite song to play Stairway or whatever, you know, yeah. <laughs> something like that. Have you guys put anything like that together we, or thought about it? In our blog, we do a lot of it, but it's not cool. super like, we, we've done some Organized. loose organization of it, but yeah. that's sort of like maybe, I don't know, it, medium to long term, we are going to start kind of almost like building out courses. Yeah. Uh, but really as a marketing thing. Like maybe it's a free, maybe there's a free course thing and the sure. whole point is that we're trying to just get leads in and get their contact information so that we can market to them. Yeah. I haven't done much of it yet, um, but as you as you can probably hear by my voice, I'm like, I'm excited about... All the opportunity. Yeah, and like marketing's fun. And yeah, so I'm excited to kind of jump in and, and start really building a lot of that stuff out. So there's, yeah. there's this company I want to mention real fast. Um, and I know we're getting short on time, but uh, there's a drone company up in Maine. I can't remember the name of them. That doesn't really matter. Um, I think this is going to relate to you later. Mm-hmm. Um, they actually took all their drone pilots because their problem was they were trying to scale nationwide or at least regionally, mm-hmm. several states. And they were like, well, how do we get people to jobs that are not in that local area? So they took they took these drone pilots. They started just they started like marketing to just collect drone pilots. They're like, hey, we have jobs coming. Drone pilots, drone pilots. They mm. started getting hundreds, and then they got thousands. Um, and then they built a directory mm. with their own reviews, video links explaining the person's uh, like training training stuff, or they'd be drone flying in this situation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and it had star recommendations to the side. And so every time they got a job, which would be a, a student in your in your case, they actually had the directory listing, mm. um, and the kid would just go pick who they wanted to train with. That person would go out and train with them, et cetera, and you'd have it for the different states and different cities. Wow. And then they double monetized it. Mm-hmm. They said, okay, now 
we're going to charge our competitors to use our directory list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. So they were mm-hmm. they were they had they we'll had find an incentive to you. Yeah, I know what you're uh, talking uh, about. Yeah, so they were able to expand. Yeah, and at the same time, they were able to charge their competitors to pay for some of their marketing mm. to to outweigh their competitors. Yeah, I'd love to look into that. that. That sounds like that's a fascinating, very very similar concept. Actually, yeah. it sounds like yeah. Um, one of the most counterintuitive things that I've learned to be absolute fact in marketing in general is that. Whenever, whenever you create a resource, and we have, you know, we have all these clients all across the board and stuff, but whenever you create a resource where you might be like, oh, I'm giving the secret sauce away, it always ends up giving you a very positive ROI mm. because it establishes you as the expert for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, you know? for sure. So, all right, so I got my funny question. Oh, yeah. I got mine. No, I got one. I got one. I got one. Okay, okay. So with what he's talking about, at Business yeah, Legends, we're, we're, we're done on time here, man. And by the way, what an awesome show this was. Oh, um, thanks. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm, I'm really excited to um, talk to you more about music. But um, so at the end of every show, um, we always ask, try to ask our uh, our guest a funny question. And this is usually where I stall, but I came preloaded with my funny oh, question. Okay. So I knew nice. what I was going to ask. Yeah, so, so you go first. Great. You go first. Because oh, yeah. mine's so, better than yours. So any three instruments, what would you combine? For, wait, wait, wait. They gotta be mo- they gotta be welded together. Oh you, my you oh, goodness! Okay. How, well, what would you do with three instruments welded together? And what I'll would have they a, be? I have a cool answer to that. All right. Yeah, I got it. Okay. So I'm you? going um, a synthesizer on the left hand, so I can do like bass stuff. Okay. Um, That's cool. And then I'm going with my feet, some kind of drum. So it's all this big. What are, you can make whatever. You're like the so, music man. You got so my, everything. Yeah. Back. So like the drums, I'm doing with my feet. Okay. My left hand, I'm doing like kind of a keyboard type thing. So it's thing. like this, and you're hitting well, it with your feet, okay? Yeah. Like this. Yep. And then, or maybe, maybe actually, it's the whole, the whole, the whole deal, okay? okay. And then just to like, so it's like a whole keyboard, but like maybe the bottom. You can program keyboards to have like a synth sure. at the bottom, and then maybe at the top something else, and then like a trumpet or something, <laughs> so that you could. Just, oh, see, that's cool. So that you've got all three. You've got like the high end. You've got like the synth middle stuff, and then the drums with your feet, and you're using all of your limbs. You can make all that's the music. Sick. You just step inside this machine and just go to town. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd yeah. be cool. All right, all right. Okay, my... they exist too already. I, I believe. I don't know if I oh, made that it? up. Or like people like you know fudge them and they make them. Oh, make yeah, their yeah, own. yeah. I gotta look this up. I didn't think it was a thing. Yeah. My oh. uh, my instrument would be. Um, just a just a two neck guitar with a bass on top and a and a guitar on bottom, and then I would have like a like a synthesizer type things that you could play something, mm. and then I would have a microphone. So, uh, yeah, so yeah, microphone. microphone's technically an instrument. Yeah, I guess, it, if I you think about it. it so, um, man, my question sucks compared to yours. Dude. Oh, okay, that's fine. that sucks. Uh, so my so my question is, what's your favorite song to teach people to play and why? It's not funny at all. I know, Ooh. but it was just my question. It was just it's a, supposed to be funny. I know, I suck. That's a tough. I mean, that's tough. I don't, and you know, I haven't been teaching in a while, so it's, it's hard. You know, I, I, if I had to answer right now, this is one of those questions where it's like, if you ask me my favorite song, it would be like, I have no idea. Sure. Um, so it kind of, you know, or maybe depending on my mood, it might be something. For, for whatever reason, right now, I'm thinking like, comfortably numb, Pink Floyd. Yeah. Or there's another one. I'm, I'm blanking. It's not time. It's. Um, Anyway, so there. Yeah. So David Gilmore, the Pink Floyd guitar player, is not a. He's not like the mo- like a shreddy type guitar. Player, no, no. But he's really nice melodic mm-hmm. stuff. And there's so many like, you know, you take a, a li- there's so many licks you can pull from from like the comfortably numb solo and then sure. like put them in your own stuff. So it's like it can give you a lot of inspiration. Yeah. Especially you know using like pentatonic scales that are not technically that difficult to play but right. a creative take on it yeah so that'd yeah. be my answer to that right now that's awesome that's but, awesome yeah. i uh i remember i mean obviously stairways like i i feel like you have to teach somebody to play that at some point you know but um i liked uh, layla by eric clock great one that yeah. was one of the first actually that was the first guitar second guitar solo i ever learned awesome. on, i have the acoustic version yeah oof that's tough um that's yeah really it was tough. it was tough but that was fun that was a really cool exploration of the guitar neck with the different scale shapes right right so that's a great that's a great one yeah so on air i want to go ahead and tell everybody it took me four dance classes to learn how to stay on beat <laughs> no. you're and not now you're on beat now you're on beat there you go ear up against the speaker and was like this <laughs> That's how long. That's how bad I was. He's musically challenged, but he could do it. You could with do it. bold music. That's lessons. right. That's it. Yeah, Give us a call. The yeah. only people who can teach me. <laughs> yeah. That's right. George, thank you so much for joining us today, man. It's been an awesome show. Awesome. Thanks yeah. for having me. Super yeah. fun. Yeah.